Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the general medicine educator. So let me discuss some of the previous year questions of the SS that is NEET SS and as well as the INACT SS. So like many of them were like clinical based questions. I have slightly modified the question and I have slightly modified the options because the questions which are being asked will be like the previous year topics but the question is slightly modified and options are also slightly modified so based on that i have made these questions okay so if you see the first question we have a 75 year old man presents to the emergency department appearing quite ill his family member says he has not had his normal energy for the last six months and they noted he was confused and lethargic for the last day or two and as you are taking the history from the family, you palpate the patient's radial pulse and notice a regular beat to beat variability of the pulse amplitude, although his rhythm is regular. Indeed, as you later take his blood pressure, you note that only every other phase one Korotkov sound is audible as the cuff pressure is slowly lowered and that this is independent of the respiratory cycle. Based on this, you suspect this patient has which of the following disorder? The options are atrial fibrillation, then cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, pulmonary embolism, severe left ventricular dysfunction. Right? So, very important in the history is what? He is like quite ill and since last day or two, the individual is like confused and as well as lethargic. These will be in the history. Whereas you take on palpation. So on palpation, you have regular beat to beat variability of the pulse amplitude with rhythm being regular. So among the options which has been given to you, the first option is already ruled out. Why? Because the rhythm being regular, that will rule out the atrial fibrillation. But in atrial fibrillation, do you have regular beat to beat variability? Yes, beat to beat variability can be there on palpation of the pulse in case of the atrial fibrillation. But the point which is going against your atrial fibrillation is the rhythm being regular is like it is against. So the rhythm in atrial fibrillation is irregularly irregular rhythm. So now what about the other options? You take in case of cardiac tamponade and sometimes in constrictive pericarditis and as well as the pulmonary embolism the pulse that you will have is the pulses paradoxes right and in case of the pulses paradoxes like what is the classical picture in inspiration there will be drop in systolic blood pressure by more than 10 millimeters of mercury that is a characteristic feature in case of pulses paradoxes okay but pulses paradoxes is commonly observed in case of the cardiac tamponade right Sometimes you observe that in constrictive pericarditis and pulmonary embolism also. But whatever the pulse which has been given to you, the description as beat to beat variability. What does that tell you? Beat to beat variability, it tells you about the description of the pulse as the pulse's alternance. Right? This is a key word here, that beat to beat variability. Now, once you understand that beat to beat variability in the pulse is nothing but the pulse's alternance, now you just retrospectively think, where do you get this pulse's alternance? Pulse's alternance, you will have this in case of the severe left ventricular dysfunction, right? So pulse's alternance is what? You have one large amplitude wave and the alternative one will be a low amplitude wave. That is what you will have in case of pulse's alternance. And why is this pulse's alternance due to? This pulse's alternance is due to cyclical changes in intracellular calcium and action potential duration. That is what is the reason for the pulse's alternance. And in case of pulse's alternance, when you do an ECG, right? When you do an ECG, the ECG, if it shows the presence of T wave alternance, right? If the ECG shows the presence of the T wave alternance, that is telling you an increased risk of arrhythmia. Right? So that is about your pulse's alternance. And in cardiac tamponade, what is that you will have is 
you will not have pulses alternance but in the ecg what you will have is the electrical alternance is what you will have in case of the cardiac tamponade so the answer in this question is what that is severe left ventricular dysfunction and we were able to rule out all other options right next question so the next question is you are asked to evaluate a 27 year old internal medicine resident reporting one week of cough coryza and low grade fever today he has developed rapidly escalating chest discomfort in the clinic he notes that the pain becomes more intense when he has taken deep breath you perform a standard 12 lead ecg on examination so this is a 12 lead ecg on examination his blood pressure is normal he is febrile and his jvp is not elevated however he appears mildly uncomfortable from the chest pain the next most appropriate step would be which of the following the options are administer aspirin intravenous heparin sublingual nitroglycerin and clopidogrel first option second option emergently obtain transthoracic echocardiogram with possible pericardiocentesis third option perform an emergency coronary angiography to evaluate the acute myocardial infarction fourth option prescribe ibuprofen and as well as colchicin F fifth option refer for treadmill testing okay so now very important history here is cough coryza and low grade fever what is it suggestive of it is suggestive of the upper respiratory tract infection right now following that the very important history is on deep breath the patient is complaining of pain so what is it suggestive of after upper respiratory tract infection if the patient is complaining of pain on increased inspiration that is suggestive of a pleuritic pain or it is suggestive of a pericarditis pain now you take the ecg also ecg if you observe very closely what is the abnormalities that you are able to make out is you are having st segment elevation in all the leads right st segment elevation is there in all the leads and that too a concave st segment elevation is there but if you take an avr in avr you are having st segment depression okay and you take the pr segment so if you take the pr segment you are observing that there is pr segment depression except in avr in avr you are having pr segment elevation and in majority of the other leads you see the pr segment it is like depressed so the presence of the global st segment elevation along with the st segment depression in avr plus pr segment depression in all the leads except pr segment elevation in avr that is suggestive of acute pericarditis so the entire clinical picture whatever has been given to you is suggestive of acute pericarditis right so how can you tell that it is like the individual is having following an upper respiratory tract infection second important point there is increase in the pain on inspiration third important point ecg suggests you of acute pericarditis so what will be the so in case of acute pericarditis what is that you need to give you need to give anti inflammatory drugs and among the options which has been given to the the anti inflammatory drugs are like you need to prescribe the ibuprofen and as well as the colchicin that is a correct statement whereas you take the other options like administration of aspirin intravenous heparin and sublingual nitrate and clopidogrel that is given in case of an ischemic heart disease right but the clinical picture is and the clinical picture in ecg is not suggestive of ischemic heart disease so your first option is ruled out and you take the second option obtain transthoracic echocardiography with possible pericardiocentesis see when will you do this pericardiocentesis is that to an emergency pericardiocentesis you do that in a case of a cardiac tamponade and in cardiac tamponade this will not be the ecg finding the ecg finding in case of cardiac tamponade will be either the patient will have low voltage complexes or the ecg will sh be showing electrical alternance so that is the reason why your option b is like ruled out third option emergency pca when will you do emergency pca if there is an mi acute mi then you will be doing emergency pca but is it suggest you of an acute mi no so your third option is also ruled out and refer for treadmill test when will you refer for treadmill test if you are getting a 
doubtful clinical scenario of an underlying ischemic heart disease and ECG is not revealing that underlying ischemic heart disease that is a point when you need to go for treadmill test ECG is already showing the ST segment elevation more than that what do you want right so this ECG is suggestive of like acute pericarditis it is nowhere related to your ischemic heart disease so that is the reason why doing treadmill test is also not required so the answer in this question is D that is fourth option right next question so if you take the third question Mr. Ravi is an 18 year old high school volleyball player with a sports scholarship to the local university as part of her admission process right as part of his admission process he is required to undergo a full medical assessment prior to taking part in the college sports physical examination reveals no abnormalities although he reports the rare episode of palpitation and lightheadedness ECG was done ECG showed PR interval like 0 0.06 milliseconds QRS duration 140 milliseconds and slurred upstroke or delta wave in the initial part of the QRS you correctly diagnose this as WPW syndrome which of the following finding is reassuring that Mr. Ravi will suffer no ill effect or need catheter ablation due to this abnormality usually in case of WPW syndrome what is that we do we do a catheter ablation and these patients with WPW syndrome like if they develop atrial fibrillation that is a very dangerous clinical scenario okay the question is now you will be able to tell among the options which has been given to you that he will not have any ill effects right he will not have any ill effects or he will not need catheter ablation let me tell you the options first option ability to increase the heart rate to 185 beats per minute on an exercise treadmill test second electrophysiology study demonstrating that the accessory pathway has both anti-grade and retrograde conduction properties third option electrophysiology study demonstrating that accessory pathway is located in the posterior septal region Fourth option, exercise treadmill study demonstrating disappearance of delta wave and wide QRS at a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. Holter monitoring demonstration occasional runs of the atrial fibrillation. So the question is which of the following options will tell you that he will not have any further ill effect and catheter ablation is not required. Right. So in case of WPW syndrome, first and foremost, very, very important if the holter monitor is showing the atrial fibrillation definitely he will have the ill effect why because in case of WPW syndrome what is that you have an accessory pathway that is bundle of Kent now through this particular accessory pathway whenever there is atrial fibrillation all these impulses from the atria they can be transferred through accessory pathway to the ventricle where the individual can develop ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation and then sudden cardiac death so if there is development of atrial fibrillation definitely it is a very dangerous scenario okay so your fifth option that is atrial fibrillation is like completely ruled out it will definitely give you an ill effect right now you take the other option because that was easy to make out so that is why i've just taken the fifth option first right then you take the other options ability to increase the heart rate to 185 beats per minute on the exercise treadmill test see whenever an individual doing an exercise treadmill test in a patient with WPW syndrome, if the heart rate is increased to 185, these particular patients, they are at increased risk of the ventricular arrhythmias, right? There is increased risk of the atrioventricular re-entrant tachycardia, right? So that is the reason why 185 heart rate increasing is not a good sign, right? These patients, they have to undergo the catheter ablation, okay? And if the heart rate is increasing to 185, it tells you that this accessory pathway has in, is having ability to conduct the anti-grade and as well as conduct retrogradely making the substrate for atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. So the first clinical scenario is not a good sign to tell you that the individual will be absolutely fine. Second, electrophysiology demonstrating accessory pathway that has both anti-grade and retrograde. That is what I was discussing. If the electrophysiology is showing that there is anti-grade anti and as well as retrograde conduction, please remember 
they are at increased risk of AVRT. So this is not a good sign. You cannot tell that the individual will not have any ill effect and you cannot tell that the individual will not require catheter ablation. Your option be ruled out. Then now see uh, electrophysiology study demonstrating the accessory pathway is located in the posterior septal region. Okay. So the accessory pathways which are present in the posterior septal region, they are at increased risk of the arrhythmias. Even while ablating also, it is you need to do the ablation of these posterior septal pathways very carefully. Why? Because when you are about to try to ablate the posterior septal pathway, there is a high scope that you may cut down the native AV nodal pathway. Right? Accidentally there can be an ablation. So it is a risky thing having a posterior septal accessory pathway. Okay. So your option C is also ruled out. Then you take option four. Exercise treadmill test demonstrating disappearance of the delta wave and wide QRS at a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. So now the there is disappearance of the delta wave upon doing treadmill. What does that tells you? That tells you that the conduction is passing through the AV node to the ventricle because when will you get the delta wave you will get that particular delta wave when the conduction is passing through the accessory pathway but here upon doing treadmill test the delta wave disappeared and heart rate is 120 see any individual and that to a young individual doing the treadmill test or exercise heart rate increasing up to 120 beats per minute it is right good it is like telling you that there is a very good sympathetic activity but in spite of this increased sympathetic activity that sympathetic activity it is not passing through the accessory pathway so how are you telling that in the fourth option that it is not passing through the accessory pathway because the delta wave is getting disappeared so delta wave is getting disappeared means that accessory pathway whichever is there it is a weak accessory pathway so the option four tells you that the individual will not have any ill effects. The option four tells you that the patient does not require the catheter ablation. Okay. So the answer is the fourth option. Exercise treadmill test demonstrating disappearancing of, disappearance of delta wave and wide QRS at a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. Right. Next question. Okay. So we have a 19 year old long distance runner who finished in top 10 of the local marathon last year presence for the cardiac evaluation after his primary care physician ordered a Holter monitor for screening purpose. On his Holter monitor, several episodes of second degree Mobitz type 1 AV block were noted, all occurring during the sleep. The patient reports no symptoms, but thinks he may have a grandfather who had a pacemaker implanted at the advanced age. What is the most appropriate next step for him? The options are exercise treadmill stress ECG, second option invasive electrophysiology study, third option reassurance, fourth option reference for the pacemaker implantation, serological testing including the thyroid stimulating hormonal levels. Okay, so what is the ECG showing? ECG is showing Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block. See Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block this is very common in young individuals right so this is very common in young individuals young healthy adults mobitz type 1 second degree av block is common and that to this mobitz type 1 second degree av block is very common during sleep hmm? very common during sleep and in patients with high vagal tone right in patients with high vagal tone because see who is he he is like a long distance runner so definitely there is high vagal tone so during sleep and as well as in patients with high vagal tone having mobits type 1 second degree av block is very common and the patient is denying any symptoms right there are no symptoms so in this case you don't require to do a treadmill test in this patient you don't require to do any invasive electrophysiology just give reassurance that nothing will happen to you okay so and what about the third option that is pacemaker implantation see i just show you a table of 
class one indications of pacemaker implantation let me show you a table right so this table is important in this table you have class one class 2a class 2b class 3 but what is important for us is like class one indications these are like very commonly asked class one indication is what definitely your complete heart block that is your third degree av block and some clinical scenario of second degree av block that to mobits type 2 you require pacemaker implantation let me tell you what are those so number one third degree av block individual having symptomatic bradycardia next essential drug therapy that produces symptomatic bradycardia third periods of asystole for more than three seconds or escape rate less than 40 beats per minute while awake post-operative post ab block not expected to resolve then catheter ablation of the av junction neuromuscular diseases like myotonic dystrophy so this scenario if there is a third degree av block it's a class one indication for the pacemaker implantation whereas you take the asymptomatic second degree av block mobits type 1 that is a class 3 indication okay it's a class 3 indication right so that is against you should not place the pacemaker right so in that way your reference to pacemaker insertion is like gone now serological testing including thyroid stimulating hormone levels okay let me tell you because in hypothyroidism there can be bradycardia but in hypothyroidism very commonly what is that you will observe is you will observe the first degree av block not the second degree av block first degree av block is very common right and in case of your hypothyroidism the other features of hypothyroidism is not present here so you are doing serological test including tsh levels like it is like completely ruled out right next question so the answer here is just reassure the patient okay the next important clinical scenario we have a 47 year old woman with history of tobacco abuse and ulcerative colitis is evaluated for intermittent palpitations she reports that for the last six months every two to four days she notes a sensation of her heart flip-flopping in her chest for approximately five minutes she has not noted any precipitating factor and has not felt lightheaded or had chest pain with these episodes her physical examination is normal a resting ecg reveals sinus rhythm and no abnormalities aside from checking the serum electrolytes which of the following is most appropriate testing the options are abdominal ct with oral and intravenous contrast second option event monitor third option halter monitor fourth option reassurance with no further testing needed fifth option referral for electrophysiology study so basically what is this point here the palpitations intermittent palpitations right and that too since like two to four days she notes the sensation of flip flopping in her chest for approximately five minutes okay so it is not like in one day like since two to four days she is observing this okay first option you take that is abdominal ct now for the development of palpitations there is no indication of the gastrointestinal triggers right there is no gastrointestinal trigger here so abdominal ct will not be helpful in this scenario at all right your ulcerative colitis whatever the patient is having that is not the trigger for palpitations okay so no role of abdominal ct right now when will you do this ep electrophysiology study electrophysiology study is indicated for patients with life threatening right the individual having life threatening or severe symptoms with syncopal attack right life threatening or severe symptoms with syncopal attack in them you need to do electrophysiology study but do you have that life threatening symptoms or severe syncopal episodes here no so role of electrophysiology is not there in this patient right then because the the patient has persistent non life threatening palpitations right so it is not life threatening palpitations now when will you do this halter see halter is placed for 24 hours 
right holter is placed for 24 hours and it is appropriate for patient in whom the symptoms happen several times over 24 hours but what is he telling like she is telling like in the past two to four days in the past two to four days she notes a sensation of her heart flip flopping in her chest for approximately five minutes so it is not in one day she is telling these symptoms past two to four days she is telling symptoms so holter to pick up this abnormality right not very much useful so even halter is not the correct answer now reassurance with no further testing needed how can you reassure when the patient is telling that since two to four days like she's telling like the chest is like flip-flopping right reassurance does not work here so what is that you need to place this patient is on you need to place the patient on the event monitor right now what is this event monitor event monitor is the monitor which is triggered by the patient right it is triggered by the patient himself whenever the patient develop that symptoms right she will activate or he will activate that event monitor and that event monitor will record the heart rhythm and that can be useful for the cardiologist to evaluate what exactly is the problem going on right so the preferred next step in this individual is the event monitor would be the ideal or best in this patient all right the next question okay so this is the last question we have a 79 year old man with history of the coronary artery disease ischemic cardiomyopathy with a last left ventricular ejection fraction right with left ventricular ejection fraction around 30 percent and the patient is also hypertensive and he presents to your office with no new complaints blood pressure is like 108 by 56 heart rate is 88 beats per minute arterial oxygen saturation is 98 percent his rhythm strip is this one based on this ecg the patient now has a definite indication for which of the following therapies what are the options amidron 400 milligrams daily aspirin 325 milligrams daily Flaconide 600 milligrams whenever there is palpitations, systemic anticoagulation with warfarin or the novel anticoagulant, and the fifth option that is transesophageal echocardiography followed by direct cardioversion. Okay, so first of all, you take the ECG. What is this ECG suggestive of, right? So it's a very clear cut ECG. You don't have a P wave, and you see the rhythm, it's an irregularly irregular rhythm. So this ECG, it is suggestive of atrial fibrillation, right? This ECG is suggestive of atrial fibrillation. Now, the question says, what is the next line of management? So, in the patients with atrial fibrillation, right? So three important, three are very, very important, right? If you take the sequence of the treatment, one is rate control. Second one is rhythm control. Third one is like anticoagulant or the antiplatelet should be given. Among all these, what is the first to be achieved in any individual? That is rate control is very, very important. Okay. So, but how is the rate in this individual? 88 beats per minute, right? Good. The heart rate is good. So there is no hurry of rate control. Now you need to decide whether the patient requires rhythm control or the antiplatelet or anticoagulant is what you need to decide in this patient. So. Now you take the clinical scenario. Is the individual having any symptoms? No, right? Because no new complaints, right? When there is no new complaints, like doing this rhythm control is not the first line treatment. Doing rhythm control is not the first line treatment. But what you need to take care, these patients with atrial fibrillation, they are at increased risk of thromboembolism. So you need to plan to give this anticoagulant or antiplatelet quickly. Right? So that is the reason why, please remember a very, very important point in this patient, rhythm control is not important because the individual is not having any symptoms. So giving amidrone is not required and flaconide you cannot give at all in patients with ischemic heart diseases because that can precipitate the risk of coronary artery disease. So flaconide is completely ruled out. Now, is it aspirin? Is it anticoagulation? Now you take the uh, fifth option, transesophageal echocardiography followed by direct card. See, when is that you will do direct cardioversion? You will do direct, uh, direct cardioversion when the individual is hemodynamically unstable, right? 
that means there is hypotension there is pulmonary edema desaturation that is the point when you do direct cardioversion but is this particular patient having any features of hemodynamically unstability no not there so that is the reason why you are doing dc cardioversion is not the correct statement right now you need to decide whether to give antiplatelet or anticoagulant and how will you decide that is based on your char 2 ds2 vas scoring system right so if you take this the individual is having the congestive heart failure the individual is having the hypertension the individual age is more than 75 years right the individual is having vascular component that is your ischemic cardiomyopathy is there so the total score is nearly almost 5 okay so total score char 2 ds2 vas scoring is 5 if score is 0 then we give antiplatelets but if the score is like more than or equal to 1 we give the anticoagulants right we give anticoagulant so what is the correct answer here is right systemic anticoagulation with warfarin or novel oral anticoagulants that will be the correct statement in this particular patient so the answer is d here not even a not even b okay so these are some of the previous year questions right so please try to solve the question by ruling out the other options why not the other options being the answer also you need to analyze whenever you are solving the previous year questions or whenever you are doing the practice multiple choice questions thank you very much